Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. So this week for my Game of Thrones bonus video, I wanted to talk all about Lyanna Stark. You know, a really big character in the context of A Song of Ice and Fire, but someone we might not ever actually get to meet. The comments by Littlefinger and Sir Barristan Selmy in episode 4, you know, set the internet on fire with R plus L equals J confirmations. Technically, they did not confirm anything about Lyanna Stark's maybe, maybe not son. So what I'm going to do is a history for her character and then explain the context for the prophecy that everyone is talking about. The one that Rhaegar was obsessed with. The prince who was promised. So just careful for spoilers for everything that's happened on the show so far. Most of this history is taken from anecdotal comments based on things that characters have said in story that we've already covered. The part of Lyanna Stark will be played by Lily Collins in Snow White Attire. I know people always ask me whenever I use other pictures for characters that we haven't seen on the show. Lyanna Stark was the sister of Brandon Stark and Ned Stark. Brandon Stark was the oldest brother, Ned Stark was the middle, Lyanna Stark was the youngest. She was like the Arya of their family. During season one of the show, Arya was even told that she looked like her aunt Lyanna. She shares a lot of personality traits with her, but they're, they're not like carbon copies of each other. Arya Stark isn't like the reincarnation of Lyanna. George R.R. R. Martin is just famous for repeating metaphors over time. So a lot of events, situations, characters in present day resemble things that happened in the past that he's talked about. But that doesn't mean that they'll play out the exact same way. He's just a self-described history nut. And a lot of times in real world history, it seems like events are repeating themselves. As described by Ned, Lyanna was wolf-blooded. Very tomboyish, very hot-blooded. She said to really have enjoyed using swords, although their father wouldn't allow her to walk around carrying a sword. But she was very skilled on a horse. So by all accounts, she was capable of taking care of herself. Very strong-willed, independent, and capable of defending herself. She was no flowery maiden. Speaking of which, I know, you know, Littlefinger made this comment about the crown of blue roses at the tourney of Hall last week. It's just that Lyanna is described as being very fond of the blue roses that grew at Winterfell. Bran Stark on the show right now actually does get a picture, like an actual look, at Lyanna Stark. He sees a girl that looks like Arya. We did a Maggie the Frog flashback, so it's possible that we could get a Lyanna Stark flashback. But there's no guarantee, and Bran Stark isn't even part of Season 5. So until they say otherwise, you know, most of what we learn about her is going to be when characters talk to other characters about her in a historical context. I actually think that's a really good way to do it. It's just a little more creative way to convey history, to do exposition. So moving along into the really important moments that we've heard about on the show, the, the tourney of Hall. right before that was when she had been promised to Robert Baratheon. When that happened, she said to have told Ned that she had some misgivings about Robert, you know, just because he was such a man whore. That's important for context in that Lyanna Stark was not in love with Robert Baratheon, as is true of most political marriages. So then we move to the tourney of Hall. The show might not ever explain it, or they, they might tell it in an offhanded story. But in addition to the Rhaegar crown of blue roses moment that Littlefinger talked about, there was another big thing that happened at the tournament. She was a good friend of Howland Reed, one of the Krenog, but you know, Jojen Reed, this character here, his father. He was very young. He was being bullied by three other squires from three larger houses. Later in the tournament, a knight wearing the sigil of a laughing tree unhorsed all three of the squires that had been bullying Howland Reed. The identity of the knight was a huge mystery. There's a lot of theories that that knight was Howland Reed himself getting revenge on those squires that were making fun of him. But there's also a theory that the mystery knight was Lyanna Stark. After he won the last bout, the knight ran off into the woods, took off his armor, and then ran off. Rhaegar Targaryen was ordered to go find out who the knight was, but he only found the shield with the laughing tree on it. Also during that tournament, Rhaegar is said to have played such a beautiful song that it made Lyanna Stark weep. So everybody loses their shit when Rhaegar gives the prize to Lyanna Stark. A short time after the tournament is when he is said to have kidnapped her and run off. So there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to those two characters having something of a connection with each other, whether it's love or, or mutual interest or something else remains to be seen. So here is where we get to the prophecy that Rhaegar is said to be obsessed with, the prince who was promised. The best theory is, is that it wasn't so much that he was in love with Lyanna Stark, he might have just thought that she was the crucial part of the fulfillment of the prophecy. We actually saw a version of this prophecy, but it was only in the books, we didn't see it on the show. Daenerys has a bunch of visions in the House of the Undying. They just, they cut that way down for the show. This is where it gets a little confusing because there's a lot of conflicting stories about who might be the prince who was promised. You know, a lot of people also think that Daenerys might be, so it would be, you know, princess who was promised in that case. In Daenerys' vision in the House of the Undying, she sees Rhaegar saying, this is the prince who was promised, and it's seemingly Aegon, the baby that was supposed to have gotten its head dashed against a wall by the mountain. 
The problem with visions is that they're open to interpretation and sometimes visions that you get can be of alternate timelines. Like, you know, had things gone differently, these things might have gone this way. So don't ever take visions in the literal context. Side note, there's also a lot of theories that the prince who was promised is also the Azor Ahai character, as told by Melisandre. It's just two different ways of interpreting a very old prophecy. You know, Melisandre comes from the faith of the Red God. They're going to have a different interpretation about the fulfillment of the prophecy than, say, someone from Westeros who's part of the faith of the Seven. When Rhaegar took Lyanna, though, he took her to the Tower of Joy. That's just like on the northern edge of Dorne. I know a lot of people were hoping we would see it when Jaime and Bronn went to Dorne. There's no promise of that, but you know, we might get an Easter egg, like someone might casually mention something about that. We don't know the whole reason why Rhaegar took Lyanna Stark. Viserys Targaryen actually told Daenerys that Rhaegar was unhappy in his marriage to Elia of Dorne. So it's possible that he was just infatuated with Lyanna. But he is someone who spent his entire life dedicated to the prophecy. As a child, he actually decided to become a warrior after reading the prophecy. So I do think that he felt like Lyanna Stark was part of the prophecy. When she was first taken, Brandon Stark found out about it and went to the Red Keep to get help from Aerys Targaryen to, to ask him to deal with it. Aerys had Brandon and his companions, other, you know, highborn nobles, arrested for treason. He accused them of plotting murder. They chose trial by combat and Aerys chose fire as his champion. This is where things really heat up with Robert's Rebellion. This is the primary reason it started, not because Lyanna Stark was taken. Starting a rebellion requires massive support. One way to do that is to kill the Warden of the North, his oldest son, and several highborn nobles. So John Aaron joined forces with the North, just like Littlefinger said he would do with Roose Bolton now, and they declared war on the Targaryens. So the rebellion didn't happen overnight. During that, Rhaegar had to leave for battle at the Trident. That's where Robert killed him. He is said to have died whispering Lyanna's name. And when Ned finally found Lyanna at the Tower of Joy, she was said to be covered in blood and whispered to Ned, promise me. The theory is, is that Ned found her after just having a baby and she said, promise me you'll take care of him. And that's what she meant. One of the few people that's still alive in the context of the show that was at the Tower of Joy is Howland Reed. We haven't seen him, but you know, unless confirmed otherwise, he's still presumed to be alive running around somewhere. So if you're ever looking for like absolute confirmation on who Lyanna Stark's child was or whether or not she actually had a child, there's still someone that the show can trot out to do that. I don't expect it to go down that way. You know, if we ever learn who Jon Snow's mother is, it'll probably be in somewhat more vague terms. Just more of what we saw last week. You know, characters telling stories that seem to imply a certain outcome. I just think it's a lot more fun that way. Most of the best theories I've seen about Rhaegar Targaryen and Lyanna Stark at the Tower of Joy take a more practical approach to the characters. He took her more because of the prophecy than, than because of love. It wasn't so much an act of aggression as an act of utility. This must happen. This must come to pass so that we can fulfill the prophecy. So if the show does anything, it's just going to be dropping hints. What I'm really hoping they do is that we see Jon Snow and more White Walker scenes. So we can see whether or not the show is going to back him into season 6 and 7. Anybody is fair game to be killed off. But it's easy to see when the show is backing a certain character as one of the pillars of the story. Like we want you to feel a certain way about this character. Like Stannis, for instance, he seemed like an asshole for the first couple of seasons, but now the show wants you to think of him as a good character. So the rest of the episodes this season will give you an idea of how the show wants you to think of Jon Snow. Lately it has been that he has very special power that Melisandre wants him to explore. All the Starks are confirmed wargs, so she could just be talking about that. And even if he really is Ned's bastard and not Lyanna's son, he would still be half noble. I mean, he would still have the same kind of power in his blood that Gendry had. So there's a number of interpretations, but you guys can let me know, you know, do you think that Jon Snow is the son of Lyanna Stark and Rhaegar Targaryen? And do you think that the show is going to back him as like one of the most important characters, you know, along with Daenerys until like season six and seven? In related news, episode five tonight, be sure to subscribe to get that. I'm going to be doing a new round of the giveaway. I will be giving away the signed copies of Feast for Crows and Dance with Dragons. They're both hardbacks signed by George R. R. Martin. So just watch my episode five video. You guys will see. In case you guys haven't seen it, you can click here for my episode 5 video. I'll add the annotation after I post the video tonight. And you can click here to learn all about the history of Winterfell. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. Let's high five. I'll see you guys tonight.